Hello. Hi, Alice. Hey. Hi, Lisa. How are you? I am. I am. I am. Thank you. I'm sorry I'm being weird today. Just keep saying I am. You'll get there. <laughs> sorry to hear about your doggy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But she's oh, I should picks say, up. Uh, she picks I up. Say, and we... Sorry. I should say greetings from duality land. Yeah. <laughs> Reminding you what it was like like once. <laughs> yeah. But two hours later, she was like down by the front door demanding her walk. I was like, okay, I won't walk you today after that. But then she's like, come on, woman, let's go. Yeah. She's funny. Amazing dogs are. Yeah. Well, they, they probably, I don't know, but they probably live second to second, right? Yeah. Not like us. Like, what's going to happen an hour from now? Two days mm -hmm. from now? I can take yeah. this, but a week from now, you know? Um, my question is kind of a silly one, because I think to be human a bit sometimes is silly. It yeah. is. So, <laughs> yeah. You, you kind of mentioned it, and the other gentleman, that all questions and i believe that and stuff arise from the ego seeking probably arises from the ego i think i'm not sure but why would the ego ask questions and search to become something that it's is becomes its ultimate dissolution <laughs> yeah it's a paradox it's like it's searching for a way to commit suicide or you know extinguish itself to a big degree not be in charge anymore and yet we're still doing it it's like its greatest longing and biggest fear is to get it over not be what it is i think there's all different types of reasons and different egos as to what attracts to this subject like when i first got into this subject i was attracted by the buddha's way of speaking about it and the Buddhist group, they they could speak about it in a very flowery term. They could also speak about it very dryly, but I liked the idea of becoming enlightened. It sounded fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and then once you, it's like anything, like once you begin to get into the detail of stuff, it's like going down a rabbit's hole. You don't know what you're getting into. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then you get more and more into it and you can't kind of stop the process. I think it's crazy the process that we go into like learning that there is nobody. Like I remember like recently I re listened to a um an audiobook by one of the first Buddhist teachers I came across. And actually in the audiobook I was surprised to hear that they were talking about emptiness and um fullness a lot. I didn't hear that back in those days. I heard the enlightenment, the bliss, the positivity. Um mm. but so like my point is, is that the the ego hooks on to these different things. For me, it was like the idea of love, like love and compassion was so important to me. And then you kind of, you know, you start going down that hole and it just gets deeper and deeper and there's some sort of self-destruction that's in play. Mm. But it's, it's not a personal self-destruction, it's like, Something else has taken over, I think. I mean, what first drew you to the subject? Oh, I think when I was, for some dopey reason, when I was a kid in my teens, I read some books and I became very attracted to what some people had sought out and became in the spiritual life. And um, it really, really stirred something in me. And then I kind of fell into... The materialistic ways, <laughs> you know, which I have to say, thank you women for that, you know, I was like, I'm not giving this up. And, um, you know, money and accumulation and everything, and then that all kind of was empty. And uh, so then it was really in the last few decades, it was pain and suffering mm. that, you know, really got me into mostly i was very attracted to buddhism and zen buddhism and the idea of just shut your mouth and meditate 
you know, just do the work, keep your questions. I don't know why, because I'm a chatty dude, but that kind of shut up and do it and see what happens attracted me. And so, um, I read a lot of that and then, um, I don't know. I, I, I know the Buddha talk about enlightenment and everything, but from what I read about him, he, he didn't say too much about enlightenment. He just was on the path to end the suffering, mm -hmm. the human suffering of death and sickness and loss of loved ones and vanquished mm -hmm. dreams and, you know, to just end that type of suffering. He wasn't looking for the pie in the sky. Mm -hmm. That's all he ever got, and that's all he ever preached. Somehow a lot of people twisted it into this, uh, well, whatever else, which is good. But there does seem to be another type of end of suffering, and that may be you, I don't know. It seems like it, which is the enlightened that somehow went beyond just the sensation of suffering and into something else indescribable. Um, mm -hmm. Me personally, I would be very happy with the end of suffering. <laughs> I think that would yeah. be enough, so I'm not sure. Yeah. I actually have to say, um, I also came with wanting to end suffering as well. Like, that was also the attraction. But, um, yeah, so that's a, what my teacher, Roger, taught, is just being happy in everyday life. So the time I met Roger, I was more happy to surrender to just being happy rather than this big fant fantastic idea of enlightenment. And have you ever listened to Roger Castillo? Sorry? Have you ever listened to Roger Castillo? I, I have not, ma'am. I know you talked about him plenty, but I didn't know it was, uh, I was, would be able, is he on YouTube or something? Yeah, you can just type in his name. Roger How do you spell Castillo. his last name? Oh, I'm not so good at spelling. C -A well, I'm, yeah. Oh, it's a C-A? Yeah, Castillo. Okay. It's like castle, I think, in Spanish or something, or Italian. Oh, okay. Castillo. Maybe somebody can pa pa post it in the questions group for me. <laughs> but I was going to have a go at spelling it then. But um, but basically, what he what I what he taught me was just being happy in everyday life. And mm -hmm. yeah, it was just fantastic learning this this approach, and and the result of it is peace in daily living. And oh. the way that this comes about is by questioning doership and who is the doer. Oh. Like that's what it is. I mean, it's the same thing of what I teach, but just said in a different way. But I really like the simplicity of that because I gave up any idea of enlightenment. I gave up any idea of going beyond. And I was just then aiming for just being happy in day-to-day -day life. Uh -huh. And... Um, towards the end of living with Roger even though there was oscillation between big suffering and um, bliss and peace in between of that the, I remember getting to points where I was like okay if this is my rest of my life I can be happy with this if this you know this state this not state but this way of being like you know, I can be happy with this so and that was very relaxing to to mm. um, to do that yeah, so you could um, watch his video and see how you feel. Well, well, you did mention one other thing that recently I was in a deep state. doesn't matter how I got there. And I, I saw that every part of my life from almost the beginning memory of it all the way through was running a thread, sometimes thick, sometimes thin, of fear. Yeah. And almost everything. And I mm -hmm. thought... Is that just cowardly me, or is it a common human experience? It's the, it's, the, it's the common human experience. It's the base of seeking, is fear. Fear and trying to get to love. So that's the seeking, and that's in the seed of everybody as soon as separation happens. This hmm. existential fear, and then the movement to try to get love and safety. Hmm. Yeah, so uh, it's I've really been... profound that you saw that, like that, that is the basis of the suffering. Well, I was found it courtesy of somebody else, but uh, put me <laughs> in the state. <laughs> but, but um, you know, recently too, and I, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but that the question of love came up a lot too, you know, and 
until I got into spirituality, love was all the conditional love that we all know about. I love you, but you better do this or I'll stop loving you. Or, you know, maybe the best human love you could ever find, I thought was, I'm sure, you know, a mother to a child, which is unconditional. No matter what that child does, I'm going to love it. The rest mm -hmm. of our love has all been conditional. I love you mm -hmm. so long as you do this, so don't do that. Mm -hmm. That universal love, that love they talk about where even you love your captors in a confined space or, you know, total forgiveness for everybody. That seems to me, for me as an individual, an unreachable state. That seems to be almost an impossible place to get to. So it seems um, like an impossible place to get to, but it's the very core of your being. It's actual your, your beingness. It's not something outside of you. So what happens is that beingness becomes identified with the character and it feels it feels like you don't have that unconditional love. You feel like you you're fearful or you're seeking or you're mm -hmm. a person and all these different things. Mm -hmm. The very center of your being is absolute unconditioned love, which is, yeah, I mean, that's the beauty of non-duality is that it's pointing to yourself. It's not something you can get or you can buy or you possess. It's yourself. It's that beingness. It's that sense of being alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it so. It feel like it when the, there's the identification with the person. I, I think, I don't know if a lot of us got that way, but I think, again, when I was having these experiences that, for me, it was, I was born, you know, when at a young age, I was pretty happy with the people around me and content, you know, four, five, six, whatever. And as interactions with humans started happening and you felt, you know, the pain that people could cause you or the betrayals or whatever, you start closing down until you're almost like uh, in a coconut shell. I don't know what else to say, where I'll give out so much of myself or I'll get so involved with people, but I will never get to the point when I'm interacting with them again. I wasn't consciously saying that, but I felt that when I was in this state, that mm -hmm. me and a lot of other people have become these cocoons uh, where we keep ourselves in a safety mm. and to come out of that would make us vulnerable again to begin as we were vulnerable when we were a child which led to mm. things that you know may sometimes were crushing to us you know mm. so that's really, it's really no. beautiful that you can see that like can you explain it so eloquently like the cocoon like i really feel and envision that well, thank you, ma'am. I'm just saying it was an occurrence. I don't know if food I was speaking to the person that helped me with it. And I said, it's all nice to know this, but I don't know if things about any lasting change. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the, the light of awareness, the light of bringing it into consciousness is the change. It doesn't maybe feel like it because it might not be quick or sudden, but it is the change. Thank you. Yeah, pleasure, Larry. Oh, sorry, I said your name on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I tried not to, but that happened. Well, doesn't bother me. <laughs> You've got carte blanche. You can say whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah, thank you.